All right. Are we? Oh, wow. This is very bright. <laughs> what? Wait, did I turn? No, I like. Do I crank this down? No, no, the other way. There you go. Why is this so bright? Hold on. Can can you hear me? You can hear me. I'll be. Let me. Let me fix this. Ah, it's very bright. Uh... Okay, let's try now. Hello? I feel like, am I just getting gray hair in general? <laughs> and that's why, but I feel like my, my face is very burnt. This light is either too powerful or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, um, are we ready for this? Three, two, one. Hello and welcome everyone. How's everyone doing? It's been a while, huh? Oh my God, let me sit down properly here. Yes. Hello, hello, uh, and welcome everyone. It's been a while. I, um, I've had, whew, I've had a bunch of things in my life that I've had to deal with. The end of the semester, personal stuff, uh, taking some time off to chill. It's been, it's been a little, yeah, I think it's, I think I'm very, very, anyway, whatever. It's been a, a hell of a month, if I may say, <laughs> but uh, hopefully I'm back. So. We're going to we're going back to streaming. We're going back to writing code. We're do, going back to doing creative things. It's it's going to be awesome. So except for next week, which I'm going to be traveling. So there's next week. There's going to be no live stream. So how's everyone doing, Travis? I've seen you a lot in the comments and in the videos. Good to meet you, Divya A B. At least. You, <laughs> Well, thank you. Yes, I do have some hair, but I think this area is not looking very promising. Um, I may have to buy a, a wig for live streams in the future, you know. But but look at here. Look at this part. It's like all grays here and the beard. It's like I'm becoming an old man. It's kind of crazy, Andres. Hola, como andas? Whew. All right. So let's do the due diligences. For those of you who might be new, Welcome. This is Parametric Camp. My name is Jose Luis. We do live streams. We record tutorials with the wonderful people in the community. Um, we have conversations back and forth, etc., etc. And then we publish the videos as polished, pseudo polished, let's say, tutorials and playlists, and we organize them into a into series that you can use to learn step by step um, the basics of some some topic. So right now we are in the middle of. We are wrapping up. I, I feel like I've said this a hundred times already. We're wrapping up a playlist called Advanced Introduction, sorry, Advanced Development in Grasshopper, where we're looking at topics of advanced um, programming and, and customization of the Grasshopper 3D modeling environment. And, um, and that's what we're going to continue doing today. Uh, we have a few videos to go over. Mevlide, good to meet you. I don't know that I we've we've seen you. Thanks for your comments. Data lists and structures. We have a bunch of videos in the introduction to parametric modeling. We have a bunch of videos that are fairly advanced on data structures and lists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you may want to check those out. And also for those of you who may want to stay tuned to what we do throughout the week, we are very active on social media, especially Instagram. So you can follow us and then you will see stories and posts about when we go live. We also have a calendar, a Google calendar you can subscribe to. It's in the description of this video and then you will get up a notification when we're going to go live. What else? And we have a Discord server that you can use to join and to join and be part of the conversation when we're not live streaming. Uh, it's actually pretty active. A lot of people posting questions, helping each other. I'm very, very proud of the community that is growing there. Okay, so 
what are we doing today? Today, oh, oh my, my coffee is still steaming. All right. What are we doing today? Today, we are continuing with the advanced development in Grasshopper. We were, we've done error handling, default parameters. We learned how to set up the development environment to do more efficient development, persistent states, simulation, auto updates. That's been really cool, actually. And I think what we're going to do today is we're going to do custom previews. And we're going to do version management. What does version management mean? First, that means if we're building a plugin, how do we handle situations where we make changes in the components that we're developing and how those affect previous definitions or previous work that has happened in the past um, and things like, and stuff like that. So, so yeah, so we're going to, and then how to deprecate components, how to do it in the right way. So we're going to learn a little bit of that. Yeah. Okay. So let's get started. Then. So I have this, I have this, which is the main file that we have been working on and we're going to do custom previews, which we don't have here. So let me fire some Rhino here. So we can take a look at, I want to take a look at what we did for custom previews back in the time, back in the time, <clears throat> custom previews. How's everyone else doing? If, if we haven't met or whatever, like say hi in the chat and let me know where you're coming from, why you're here, all those kind of things while I prepare custom displays. Yes. So I have this and I have, oh, what? Wait, 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 wait. Why is grasshopper white? Oh, oh, because, um, I changed the color canvas for a video that I made the other day. Oh, so now we need to change it. Yeah, 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 yeah viewport meshes, custom display. Uh, so we're going to need to change the canvas. And how do we do that? Mm. Hey, bus, 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 bus start. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Not cool. <laughs> hey, Mr. Bus. Um, thank you. I appreciate I'm very happy you're comfortable now with Grasshopper. Now it's the good time to now get better and then just learn how to code and then just learn how to make your own Grasshopper stuff, you know? That's the next step. So we're... Uh, all right, preview components here. Okay, so we're going... Hmm. Preview components and then custom previews hmm. is here. Mesh components, document components, preview components, a vector preview, a cur curvature graph, and then we did surface curvature graph. Oh, that was quite a lot. And mesh face planarity. But this was interesting because it had. Huh, interesting. So we could actually do, um, we could extend and do mm -hmm, custom previews and perhaps an exercise here. I'm writing myself a few notes, sorry. Uh, custom preview exercises. And then external libraries. Hey, Nicolas. I've missed the community as well. Thanks for being here. So we have the preview components and then we have the custom display. So I'm just going to copy all of this and I'm going to put it here on the side and I'm just going to leave that there. Okay. So, all right. So I take this back. So we're going to, I'm going to make a small video on how to change the color of the canvas. And do I have the video of why I did that? 
let me find that. Let me find that. Yes. So I made this video that was kind of like a, I exploring the idea of exploration, blah, blah, blah. But in order to make it very clean, I wanted all the backgrounds to be white. So, so, and all the custom previews to have custom colors. So that's why, this is why I chose the white background. Uh, okay, so perhaps we can have this somewhere here. Okay, so. So, okay, so I'm gonna make a video on custom canvas. And where is that video going to go on the playlist? So if you have the playlist, if we have P camp, we have the playlist and we have advanced development. Nope. Beautiful playlist here. So that should go. Where did we customize? Rendering custom previews. Now, there was one where we changed the color of something. Advanced geometry, uh, data components, understanding uh, how to simulate a bouncing ball, external libraries, the Grasshopper SDK, document components. I think it was this one. And it was this one where we did change some of the exactly. So we, where we changed here, the color of stuff preview color. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to extend and make a second version of this video where I'm going to change the color of the campus. Mm hmm. Okay, we're going to do that. So I'm going to put that here. And then which file are we going to use for that? Data components document components. And that file, sorry, I'm a little all over the place, but it turns out exactly, but uh, document components, preview colors, etc. Yes. So we're going to extend this one here, I guess. Hmm. But in order to do that, I actually need to change the color back to normal. Okay. Okay. So let's do that. I'm going to change the color back to normal. And I'm going to, I'm going to do that right here. Okay. I'm going to change it back to normal. And then I'm going to work on this file here. I'm going to create a new folder that's going to be eight exercise eight, eight B, uh, canvas color. Yeah. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to extend, am I going to use the same files or am I going to make a new file? I can probably extend, I can probably just work on this one here. And then I can use, I don't need to use this. <clears throat> I probably just want to do, probably want to start with this. And I probably want to start by saying, hey, I did make this video recently. Um, it was like this, but in order to make it look clean, I recorded Grasshopper here and I postpart I edited with with video editing software and but in order to do that I had to record that and I need a clean white background. 
<clears throat> and it relates to what we've learned before about uh yes okay okay so we're going to do that <clears throat> okay so let's get started Woo -hoo. Chuk -chuk -chuk -chuk. let's do this oh it's been a while i'm kind of rusty in this whole video recording game <laughs> let's do this Hello, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp and welcome to another video in this series Advanced Development in Grasshopper where what I would like to show you is something that I worked on recently is that I made this video for some training materials some lectures and I wanted to make a video where I was explaining the idea of parametric modeling so the idea that you put together components you explore all the possibilities you have etc so I made this video where I basically recorded I screen grabbed on the left hand side the rhino viewport and on the right hand side the grasshopper canvas but in order to make the video very clean and very elegant what i did was that i changed the background of the rhino viewport to white as you have seen in my previous videos but i also needed to change the background of the grasshopper canvas to um to a full white color in order to cut those two things out and then make a clean nice video with some video editing software so for that, I actually had to change the color of the grasshopper canvas background, which ended up requiring some custom code, you know, which relates a lot to what we have learned in the previous videos about how to write C sharp code to change the things that uh, affect the document. So I would like to teach you right now how to write a simple component that you can use to customize the color of the canvas of your grasshopper definitions. Let's take a look at that. And um, I'm going to close this because we're not going to use this right now. And I am. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to I'm going to drop this here because I want to highlight <clears throat> this, uh, the work of James. Yeah. And actually, why don't I, I'm just going to make the, I'm just going to make the thing actually. So I'm going to drop it here. <clears throat> so yeah, so switcher, and then it's going to be a boolean. And then here, I'm going to do a canvas. Let me see what James had here. Canvas, canvas back. And then I am going to do canvas <clears throat> grid. And then there's going to be canvas edge and this is going to be canvas shadow. Um, yeah, shade. And then here I'm going to preview color. Uh, canvas, this is going to be canvas color. And I'm going to drop here a toggle. <clears throat> and I'm going to drop here a few swatches. Okay. I want to drop a few swatches here. Canvas, canvas, edge, and shade. And this is going to be whatever. It's going to be black, and this is going to be some kind of uh, gray here. I think that probably works. Actually, let me use some color for that. I'm going to use a very bright pink. Where is pink? Yes. 
I'm going to use this. And then for this one, I'm just going to do the same, but with some transparency. And then it's going to be the same, but with some transparency. There you go. And here we go. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, um, I'm going to put that in there and I'm going to drop this here. Okay. <clears throat> And I'm going to put a panel here with the link. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's do this. My microphone is working, right? Yes. Let's do this. <clears throat> Before we start, I would like to give a thumbs up and some credit to James Ramson. I was inspired by his, um, he, the example that he posted on his website, which by the way, I very strongly recommend. It very, it's very good. It has a lot of resources on like tiny snippets of cool things that you can do with Grasshopper, uh, C Sharp, and the, the, the P programming language, etc., etc. So uh, make sure to check this out. There will be a link to this post uh, in the description in this video or in here where I'm going to be prototyping this example. So in the video, in the previous video, we saw how to write components that change things about the document that we're working with. So I'm going to add here a new component that is going to be changing the canvas colors. So as you've seen in previous videos, this is a C sharp component, right? And I have added this input called the switcher so that we can turn on and off these custom colors. And then I have added, and this is going to be of the type Boolean, of course. And then here I have added four more inputs, and uh, which are the colors of the grid, of the back, of the edge, and of the shade. We will take a look at what those mean. And this is going to be, let's say, super black, for example. And then what I need to remember to do is that these are going to have a very specific uh, data type, which is going to be system color. So what I need to do is that I need to go here and make sure that we are choosing system color for each one of these four inputs. So system color, system color, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right, beautiful. So once we got that, I'm actually going to full screen this because we're not going to use the viewport at all. So once we have that, what I can do is the following. I can just double click here and you can see that all my inputs are now here as part of the system, correct? And what I would like to do is just to make things easier to type. I'm just going to make sure that I'm importing and using here system drawing. Okay, so that I can type my color stuff right away without having to type system.drawing.color. blah blah blah, which is a little too much. And then once I have this here, the first thing that I would like to do is I would like to make sure that switcher is if this is on, I'm going to change some colors. Otherwise, if it's not, I will probably go back to the original colors of grasshopper standard, uh, the standard canvas. All right. So one or the other, and I'm not going to output anything. I could actually just simply remove this because it's not going to be useful at all. And then what I would like to do is I would like to make sure that when I get here, I would change the color of a particular element of the canvas to the color that has been given here as an input. How do I do that? Well, as we saw in previous videos, we have the Rhino Common API, which gives us access to geometry manipulations and things that have to do with grass uh, with Rhino. But we also have the Grasshopper SDK, which gives us access to Grasshopper specific stuff 
like access to components, access to how the document works, solutions, etc. In this case, because we're modeling with we're changing the canvas, we want to change something that is actually part of Grasshopper. So that's why we need to go specifically to the Grasshopper SDK or the Grasshopper big main library. And we need to start accessing from this element many of the things that are part of this very large uh, and complex object that has a lot of information, data types, etc. etc. You can see that it has a lot of stuff, central settings, documentation, blah, blah, blah. Where we're going to situate ourselves is in the graphic user interface. And then we're going to set here and we're going to say, well, there's actually a lot of stuff here, equations, colors, canvas, base, etc., etc., and a lot of classes to do separate different things. So this is basically a rabbit hole. You can explore this forever, but the one we're looking for is here in Canvas. And within Canvas, there is something called the Grasshopper Skin, which is a static class that has access to a bunch of properties that we can read from if we just want to know which colors they are, or that we can, um, or that we can write to. And actually, now that we're doing this. I remember that I don't really know what the colors, what the default colors are. Let me, let me, for example, do the following. Let me say, I'm going to spit out what is the default color right now for the back. So I'm going to say grasshopper, U, UI, uh, whoop, sorry, canvas, grasshopper skin, what is this? Grasshopper skin and then canvas back. And I'm going to spit that out through the component. And then what I'm going to get is the current color of the canvas, which you can see is 1212, 208, um, 200. And I'm going to internalize this data. Can I do that? Copy, can I internalize? I cannot. So I'm just going to do here and then this is going to be the back, okay? I'm just going to say, well, what about other colors? So what is the edge, the color of the edge? And I'm going to run this and it's zero, zero. So that's boring. So what is the color of the grid? I'm going to execute this and it's zero, zero with a 30% transparency. So that's going to be grid is zero, zero, zero uh, with a 30% transparency. And what else do I need? The shade. Um, the canvas shade, this is going to be uh, same, but with an 80% transparency. All right. So I think with that, I am ready to now to change those. So I'm going to remove all of this here. And I'm going to remove this and we're going to go one by one. And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if switcher is true, I want to change the back of the canvas to this color here. So let me turn this on, grasshopper screen, and then canvas back is going to be equal to whichever color is part of the input. Canvas back. So this value that is given me is being given to me as an input. Otherwise, if this is not, I would like to go to the default value, which I got here. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to say color from A, R, G, V, and A is probably full <clears throat> color. So that's going to be, do I have to input the always the alpha? Do I have the alpha? No, so I can do R, G, V. So that's going to be 212, 28, and 200. I think we should be ready to go with this. So let me try this out. I'm going to close this, right? And right now this is false. So we are getting the default value. And if I turn this on, boom, the back is now full white or full red or full whatever I change here. And if I go back to that, then we get the default value. Beautiful. So then let's just write the rest real quick. So let's see. So I'm just going to copy all this stuff here because I'm going to be reusing it a lot. <clears throat> I'm going to copy this. So that's going to be skin dot canvas grid. Oh, canvas grid is going to be equal to 
canvas, whoop, canvas grip. And then here is going to be canvas grip and then color from, ugh, I'm very sloppy with the typing today. From RGB, that's going to be 30, 0, 0, and 0, if I am correct. So let's try that out. Okay, the grid is now very, very, I can probably make this full white, correct? Yes. And um, so this is how I did it back in when I was trying to do the other. And now if we go back to default, it looks like we have black lines with a 30% transparency. And if I now wrap this up, I'm going to wrap this up by saying canvas edge is going to be equal to canvas edge and then canvas what shade is going to be equal to canvas shade there's a typo there and then here canvas edge is going to be equal to color from rgb and what did we get for the edge the edge was black basically and canvas canvas what is it called shade the default was a color from rgb 80 percent transparency not 80 percent transparency 80 value which is it's not exactly a percentage it's from 0 to 255 and when we do that and i turn this on the canvas edge and the canvas shade are these areas here so the edges this hard line here and the shade is this gradient that is popping out here and i'm assuming there's also colors to for this shade here etc etc i mean there's a lot of stuff so you can actually keep you can actually keep exploring and looking at for example uh the columns and rows this is an integer right this is not a color i'm assuming this is probably going to change the size of those um how big are the the grid lines in each direction the mono mono color so i don't know if this is to change to switch between monochrome and polychrome you know but there's a lot of stuff palettes uh, panels skins locks wires you can change the, the colors of the wires as well there's a lot of things you can do here so i'm going to leave that up to you to explore how do you like how would you like to change the colors in your canvas and all the things that you can customize about the canvas i'm going to leave that as an exercise for you but um but yeah and i believe there's actually plugins that do this but you can see how straightforward writing such plugins or customizing this for yourself and you could do conditional stuff you could do you could do you could read information or geometry from the component from somewhere and then pipe that into this component so that the colors of the canvas somehow are reflective of what's happening with the geometry. If you get an error somewhere, maybe you, the canvas turns red, you know, and if everything's going well, the canvas has the full colors. I don't know. You can get pretty creative with this, you know. So, but I'm going to leave that up to you. All right. So beautiful. Thank you very much for being here. If you liked what you saw and if you learned something, maybe give us a thumbs up, maybe subscribe to the channel say hi in discord in the comments whatever uh, otherwise see you in the next video bye bye all right mm. okay <clears throat> beautiful how's everyone doing ming gang ming Ming Gang. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's pretty awesome too. So, did I save that? Oh, oh. Oh, oh. Did I save that file? Oh, no. Okay. Oh, I see. Yes. Good, 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 good. Oh. Hmm.
what is the file that I'm using for? Yeah, I need to remember to add this somewhere. Okay. Oh, well. Review components. <clears throat> Custom display. All right, let me situate myself. So what are we doing next? So what we said was we are going to, what do we, we're going to do custom previews. Okay. So for that, I would like to then open custom display. I would like to have this open and show how, uh, yeah, so. So that's one thing I want to have open. And the other thing I want to have open is, uh, what is it? Custom preview components. Yes. Here I want to have preview components. It's basically what I just closed right before. I want to preview a vector. And I think what I'm going to do is that I'm going to, I'm going to, what am I going to do? So we're going to do, yeah, I've kind of forgotten how we had structured the, the plugin we were writing together, right? Uh, what I'm going to do is we did have, we don't have preview component, but we do have preview components here. So I will have to create a new folder here and it's going to be preview components and it's going to be vector, for example. So we're going to call that vector. And then we're going to write a new component there. But let's do, let's do that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're going to also output here the vector length. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm thinking how to I'm thinking how to tell the story. Just give me one one minute. We have this. How am I going to start the video? Okay, yeah, I'm just gonna say, remember the previous video, we did this, we had custom previews, but that's actually quite easy to do also with, um, with uh, custom components, you know, so we're just going to do that. Okay. So let me show you how to do that. And then we're going to switch to the plugin. And I'm going to make, and I will do that offline. I'm going to make a new custom preview, a new, and I'm going to write all the stuff, etc. And then we're going to write the code. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's do this. <clears throat> Hi. This is Jose Luis here at Parametric Cam, and welcome to another video in our series, Advanced Development in Grasshopper. 
What I would like to teach you in this one is if you remember from the previous video where we discussed how to create custom previews in C Sharp script components, you may remember that we have this possibility of writing a C Sharp component that creates its own rendering and draws its own geometry on the Rhino viewport. So for example, here we wrote a visualization for vectors where given any input point, any anchor point, and that vector it would draw uh, an arrow on the viewport and it would also display here on the tiny corner the actual length of that vector, right? And if you remember from previous videos, what we did was we used these overrides, so these additional functions that we add to the Grasshopper components to manage how viewport, how the viewport, how certain things are drawn on the viewport. In this case, an arrow is basically a wire, so that's why we use this particular override function called draw viewport wires. What I would like to do in this video is I would like to teach you how to do this exact same thing, but on your native Grasshopper plugin that you're writing from scratch in Visual Studio. And you're going to see that the way to do this is almost, almost entirely identical. It's literally almost going to be copying and pasting. All right, so let's take a look at how to do that. Okay. I did we have a file? We had a file where we were on uh, this one. This is the file that we were using for all of our components. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. There you go. And it was this one here. Okay. Um, all right. So we have this. So the, the component will go here. And then here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add, I'm going to add, uh, a folder called preview components, preview components, and I'm going to add a new item, which is going to be a grasshopper. And that's going to be vector preview component. And I'm going to just to be consistent with everything we've been doing. I'm going to circle. I'm going to call this vector preview, and I don't know something like vec preview, and then renders a. Did I close the other one? And we didn't have anything out. So renders a preview of this vector on the viewport. How's everyone doing? Hmm? B camp and it's going to be preview. And then for the inputs, we're going to register P manager dot add at an add point parameter. And this is going to be called the anchor a, a base point for the vector preview. And then it's going to be an item. And then P manager is going to be add vector parameter, and it's going to be the vector, and this is going to be V and the actual vector, for example, and then item access. All right. And here, nothing to output. We don't need this here. Nothing to output here. And then so for solve instance, um, define placeholder variables. So same thing, we're going to define point 3D. And we're going to call this anchor. And 
point with the unset and then the vector 3d is going to be called the vector and then it's going to be unset as well and this is going to be the n curve and this is going to be the vector okay and here we're going to have the solver the solver okay i think we should be good here and so we don't need this anymore okay so we're going to go back here and i'm going to talk code here at one point all right Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. As we've done in previous videos, what I would like to do is just because we're going to start a new category of preview components I have created on our project, on our parametric cam plugin, I have created this folder called preview components and I have created a new component called vector preview with the grasshopper template. And I've already offline, I have filled in a bunch of stuff. So I fill in then the description, the name of the plugin, etc. I created two inputs, one of the type point, which is going to be that anchor and another type or another one of the type vector, which is going to be the actual vector we want to render, okay? And something that is going to be particular about this uh, component, I'm not sure if we have seen that before actually, is the fact that for the output, we're actually going to have nothing. We're not gonna register any output because the only use of this component is going to be that virtual, that visual rendering. We actually don't need to output any data out of it and this, will actually result in the component having that nice jagged um, uh, saw-like and which, which you're going to be see very soon, Note, denoting that there's no output coming out of it. And then I have copy pasted like a bunch of the typical boilerplate. So the predefining placeholder variables and then doing the thing where we pick up the inputs and we store them there, correct? And then what I have left for us to do is how to solve this and how to add the overrides for the preview. So if you remember in this example, what we did was we basically had this function, which was a function that was specifically designed to take any geometry and then figure out how to render some custom preview on the viewport. The problem was that because it needed to be a special function living in the same scope as our solver, we have the problem of how do we communicate between the two functions, the one that solves the geometry and the one that actually takes that geometry and draws a preview on the render, how to communicate between the two. Because this function is automatically invoked by Grasshopper. We don't have, we cannot call here, be like, hey, I'm going to compute the length of the arrow and I'm going to manually draw it on the viewport. That doesn't work like that. So the trick that we used was using this persistent variable. So creating a variable that lived in the same scope as the two functions, and then using that variable to store the information that we computed in our solver. So we compute how long is the line, we store it here. And because this variable is also accessible by this, uh, this override function, the one that previews things on the, on the screen, because both have access to that value, then that arrow can be drawn from this function. I'm not sure if this is a trick, if it's a hack, or if, it has, if, if it's actually the only way to do this, or if there might be a more elegant way to do this. If you know it, just let us know in the comments. But I think this is a very standard way of dealing with this issue. So we're going to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to compute a line, which is going to represent that arrow. And then we're going to add the overrides to take that uh, the information of that line and render it in our preview. So as you learned in previous videos, something that I can do is I can, this is the global scope of my component. 
So what I can do is I can define stuff here. And I can define a new variable that I'm going to call the arrow, and which is of the type line. And then because this <coughs> is defined in a global scope, it will be accessible by the solver, but also by any other function that I add after that. So what I would like to do here is I would like to say, this needs to be a new line. And let me just, a new line that is going to go from the anchor and that is going to go to, it's going to follow the vector. You see, I'm using the override that takes a starting point and a span vector. When this gets executed, this line is saved in this variable and we already have that information available. The next thing to do then is to add these overrides, the same that we did before, to draw all the wires and points with that method. How do we do that? We don't really have that button here, the nice uh, button that adds all these overrides right away. The way to do that is using Visual Studio autocomplete uh, features. So I know that if I type protected override, it turns out that Visual Studio already knows which methods in Grasshopper components are suitable to be extended or to be overwritten. And you can see that it already gives me a bunch of different descriptions of things that I could, uh, that I could overwrite. And actually, I'm not getting what I want. Maybe it's not protected. Exactly. Maybe it's public. So uh, that was because it's public. Now I can see a different set of those methods. Remember that the accessibility parameter cannot change when you create overrides. And you can see, for example, that here I have a bunch of stuff add runtime messages, which we already know we have used it, but we can actually customize it. It's pretty cool. We can hack the bake geometry functions. We can add things to the render geometry. We can compute the clipping box. We can change the description of things. And we have these two here, draw viewport meshes and draw viewport wires, which we're already familiar with. And as you can see here, draw viewport wires has the IGH preview arguments, which is this, um, which is this, uh, I'm going to call it, I'm going to say it, which is this object that contains a lot of functionality that we can use to draw things on the viewport. So I'm just going to very much go ahead and copy and paste everything that we have here. And I'm going to leave here the base dot draw viewport wires to make sure that we're not changing completely the behavior we're only adding to the behavior of the default function. What this is doing is the baseline draw viewport wires, which is this one, is still going to be executed. But after that, I want to also draw all this other stuff that I have here. This is going to be the arrow and the Rhino document, which I actually need to somehow manually load. Let me remember how to do this. How did we do this? Does anyone remember? Um, I do this dot document on ping document this document. Uh, I think it was I think it was simply using Rhino, no? Wait. So I think it was Rhino dot document. No, active. Mm, I've done this. I know I've done this in the past. I always forget. I always get lost with this stuff. Uh, display. No. Doc objects. I don't think it was doc objects. No. Mm, any guesses, folks? Otherwise, I'm going to, where do I have an example of that? Where have I done that in the past? Mm, let me see. Oh, I know where I've done it. Mm -hmm. Let me find that. Right now, here, here, here. Oh, oh, here. Mm -hmm.
Nope. Rhino Duck. And where do I get Rhino Duck from, Victor? Rhino, Rhino Duck. Exactly. Very good. And here, views. No? Rhino Duck, active view. Active Duck. What was the full? Rhino Duck, active Duck. Views. There you go. <clears throat> There you go. Active views. Exactly. Thanks a lot, Victor. Always saving my ass. Oop. <laughs> I should not say that. Thank you. <laughs> you always got my back. <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right. So that was that. Okay. So then. Okay. Ah. <clears throat> Exactly. And Victor, <laughs> who always has my back, just give me the hint of how, how it was. It's under rhino.rhino.doc, active document, and then views, and then active view. That is where we can find what we can, we're basically accessing Rhino, the document that we have in, the active document that we're loading, the four views that we can see, which one is the one that we currently are using, and then we're reading the boundaries, the size, and getting the height. Okay? Beautiful. So if we do this, <clears throat> this should work. And um, if we run our Grasshopper plugin, what I believe will happen is that we're going to open Rhino and Grasshopper and we're going to open our components file, which, uh, okay, fine. Open the recovery, whatever. Oops. And where are we? And I don't know what's happening here. Yes. So here we got components. Very good. And, um, okay, beautiful. So then we should have here under preview vector preview. So let me copy and paste. Oops. Oh, I don't have the other one. So let me copy and paste this, um, this part here, which we're going to use. And we're going to use it here. And uh, the background of my grasshopper is purely white because I just recorded a video on, <laughs> I just recorded a video on how to change the background in grasshopper. So Okay, so here is going to be the anchor and boom, exactly. And you can see that we are having the problem that we ran into the first time we did custom previews, which is that the arrow has the tip cut. And that is because when we calculate the bound, when, when Rhino decides how much geometry should be rendered to speed things up, it makes like rough calculations about the bounding box of all the geometry that needs to be rendered. And because we didn't account for that, we didn't tell Rhino that this was an additional object to take into consideration for that bounding box, then it's cutting it off. So what we need to do is I'm going to save this, okay? And I'm going to close this. And then I am going to go back and make sure that we also override, as we did in the original, we also override the clipping box property and make sure that we return the arrow, all right? The bounding box of the arrow. So let's take a look at how to do that. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to say public override. And in this case, I'm going to look for clipping box, you see? And then what we get is we have to return the base clipping box, but plus the, uh, the, uh, the bounding box of the arrow. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? Uh, so that's going to be, how is this going to be? Clipping box. Okay, so there's going to be a getter. And then in the getter, we need to combine. Okay, we have here, return. Okay, 
so we're going to need to add the two together. So we're going to, um, how do I combine bounding boxes? <clears throat> bounding box, union, it doesn't even matter the union of boxes A and B. Okay, that sounds good. So I can do return bounding box union of base dot clipping box and then arrow dot bounding box. All right, let's run this. I'm going to sh I'm going to close this custom display. No, yes, I'm going to save this. Uh, I'm going to save this. Yeah, fine. <clears throat> Okay. Oh boy, and I didn't. Oh. Okay, so I'm gonna have to write this again. Mm. Where did I have the other file? Custom previews, custom display. Here. All right. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste it here. And I'm going to do the preview here and here. And this is going to be this point here. And we now have the full thing. <clears throat> okay, that looks good. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to close. I'm going to close everything then. And I'm going to go back to where we were. And I'm, I was, all right, see you, Nico. We were here, okay. As you can see, the default override is basically returning the clipping box of the base. So whatever Grasshopper automatically computes as the clipping box. We want to keep that, but what we want to do is we want to make sure that that clipping box is both whatever it was before, plus the one that we are adding with our new custom geometry. So what we would like to do, we would have to do is change this slightly. So first of all, instead of just simply returning one object with the arrow notation, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to make sure that I write it um, in a way that I'm specifying that this is the getter. Actually, this is not necessary. And then what I'm going to do is here, I'm going to return I'm going to use the static method from the class bounding box, which is union and allows me to take two bounding boxes and combine them together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I want the bounding box, the clipping box of the base. So what I had before, but what I also want is from my arrow, my bounding box. So I want to combine the two together. And actually I could have written this in a shorthand way I could have written it like this. It's basically the same thing. Perhaps I'm just going to leave it here so that we can see the comparison, but it's basically the same thing. I'm going to run this now. I'm going to load components here. I'm not sure why Rhino is so vertical these days. I'm having a problem with that. Uh, and then you can see that now with the changes, if I zoom out, we can see that the arrow renders fully without the clipping of the tip. All right, beautiful. So that's it. The only thing you need to do when doing custom previews is make sure to overwrite either the wires or the meshes function and to make sure to properly handle the clipping box situation, uh, just like we did in C Sharp, all right? And uh, I'm not sure if you remember um, 
Let me show you something. It's going to crash. Visual Studio. Yes, it did crash. Visual Studio. Okay. So are we going to do this or not? So what I had was maybe we can just do custom previews exercises, but this is basically replicating what we have. It's probably not, probably not very interesting. I'd rather do version management, I think. So yeah. So if you remember, we did an exercise when we talked about this topic where we replicated, we created several preview components such as vector, the curvature graph of a of a, um, the curvature graph of a curve, the curvature graph of a curve. We also replicated them. Um, we also took a look at the surface curvature of a B rep, and we also took a look at the planarity of the faces of a mesh. So I'm not going to create another video with these previews, but um, I will leave it as an exercise to you, the viewer, to just take. A look at this code and then translate the things that we did to find planarity to mesh things up etc into a <clears throat> grasshopper native uh, component in the plugin it's actually a really good exercise to learn to learn otherwise if you don't want to do this yourself we will be replicating the full c sharp uh, we will be replicating all the components that you see here prototyped in c sharp we will eventually replicate them in the plugin and the code will be accessible. So it's up to you whether if you want to do this as an exercise for yourself or if you just want to take a look at how we did it as part of the code, of the code examples, right? Beautiful. Thank you very much. And if you learned something or if you liked this video, maybe consider subscribing, hitting the like button and all those things. Otherwise, I will see you on the next one uh, on this list. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. All right. Okay, so let me write myself a few notes here. So let's, first of all, let me close this. We don't need this. We don't need this either. We don't need this. No preview components. Uh, this was good here. Changing canvas colors, custom previews. We did that. <clears throat> Add card to previous preview components at the very end. Mm -hmm. And this should be a, I think so, yeah. Okay, how was that? Did you like this? Was it interesting? Um, okay. All right, folks, I'm going to take a bio break. I will be right back in one minute. Give me a second.
Okay, so what's next? We are going to do version management. What does that look like? Well, there's, I'm going to need to, um, I'm going to need, what am I going to need? I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about how to, for example, create a component that returns the version of the plugin. And uh, in order to do that, Grasshopper plugin info, description, author name. Do we have here, what other overrides do we have? Assembly icon, license version. Gets the version. And for example, 0 0.01. And so that's one thing I want to talk. So let's say, for example, the vector preview, not this one. Just don't want to add that number. So we can be manager that add text, you know, uh, version. This is going, I'm just going to try things out here. And then an item. And then here under di.set data for zero, I would like to set what do I like to set? Uh, how do I access the assembly, the grasshopper assembly? This, how do I access this assembly, the plugin info? Because this pcam plugin info dot assembly. Yeah, but this is not. Hmm. Hmm. Let me do some Googling here. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to access the va these values from another component. But since they are an instance, they are not static, I cannot access them. Um, okay, grasshopper access plugin author name description. And you know, uh, blah, blah. class getters access oh, uh, grasshopper C sharp. Your first component body syntax. And then, yeah. Nothing into this. Just because I think that since the, when we make a new user, we'll definitely use it later. Okay, this is not. Nope, that's not what I want. <clears throat> We can also just do it manually, honestly. Uh, it should have one on a, uh, with a public empty constructor which implements assembly info. Grasshopper kernel assembly info with this by the user and grasshopper core with this. I need more a proper name. Providing a proper assembly info class means your plan will be correctly 
and recognizably <clears throat> displayed in the Grasshopper interface. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, how do we use this? How do we load? How do we access that information? Mm. I mean, something that I mean, we could do bar info e equals equals new pcam plugin info. And then here from info, just get the version. But I kind of don't like that. It looks it feels very wrong for some reason. It feels very wrong. It feels like that should be like a global static property of the class. You see, I got this and the info is showing correctly. Mm. I guess we could do that. Or I can also teach you how to do it the static way. Uh, which is tab properties and utilities. And we can create a new class, for example, add a new item. And it's going to be a simple class that doesn't really and then uh, public static class, um, <clears throat> which can be, for example, custom plugin info. And then, for example, here we can just have public uh, string, uh, public static string version, and then it just, just returns this. And then from here, we can just say, instead of this, we can just say custom pcam plugin utilities, pcam plugin utilities, custom plugin info version. I kind of like this better. But I guess we can talk, we can do both. Honestly, I guess we could do both. Yep. So let's delete this. Tab properties. And let's remove this as well. Mm -hmm. And how am I going to start the video? I guess I will do an intro after when I have the results. So I'm going to write myself here that I need to make an intro because otherwise I'm going to totally forget. Absolutely forget. I need to make an intro. <laughs> okay, so the intro will be the last thing and we're going to start with we're going to start with um, utility components. I'm going to create a new, <clears throat> I'm going to create a new, I'm going to add a new folder and this is going to be info. And then here I'm going to add a new item, which is going to be uh, plugin version component. And this is going to be plugin version, version returns plugin 
bcamp plugin version. And then category is going to be bcamp and subcategory is going to be input. Okay, inputs, nothing here. And output is going to be pmanager at text parameter version v string description plugin version semantic and then here access item i'm going to explain what semantic versioning is semantic versioning exactly <clears throat> And um, solve instance, I'm not going to get anything. And then just outputs here. Where are the outputs? Outputs here. And none of these, we don't need any of these. Okay. All right. So let's do this. As I said, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a component that just simply returns the uh, the current version of the plugin that we're working with. Okay, so it's going to be super easy. I'm going to create, I have created here a new category for us, a new folder called info, and I have created a new component called plugin version component. I added like some descriptions, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. What's interesting again is that we're not going to have any input for this component. It doesn't need anything to work. It only is going to only have one output, which is going to be a string and it's going to be the version in semantic form. I don't know if you've ever been familiar with semantic versioning, but semantic version is basically a standard or a convention on how to name the versions of your code. And what the standard does is that it suggests that the version numbers should be three and that those three should be the major version, the minor version and the patches. What this roughly means is that when is that you should increase the number of your of your plugin, the major number when you're going to make make changes that are going to break code of versions that are numbers less than the major one. You should increase the minor number when you're making changes that only increase uh, the functionality of the of the whatever you're writing, but doesn't break anything, but is backwards compatible. All right. And the last one is you should increase this number when you're making fixes, when you're making patches or where you're fixing something that broke, perhaps with any of the updates that you have done to the other two levels, right? So you're more, this is actually quite interesting to read and it's a standard that most people use. Uh, also the standard is that you stick to zero for the major version so long as you are in alpha or beta and you don't uh, update this to version one until you know that it's ready for production or for people out there in the wild to use. Okay. So anyway, so that's just uh, something interesting to know. So here in the outputs, what I would like to do is I would like to output the version of this component, all right, of, of this plugin. There are three ways that we could do this. The bad one, the okay one, and the more custom one, if you will. So I'm going to walk you through the three ones that I suggest. The first one, the bad one, is to basically hard code that value here. What that means is, let me say, I'm going to set the data here uh, for the first output and I'm going to set it to the value that I want to do. So I could just simply say, well, I can just write here 0 0.10.0, 0, which is going to be the current version of my plugin. And if I run this, I think this is actually going to work. So let me run this here and we're going to load uh, our file, a Rhino file, and we're going to load Grasshopper. And let's see if we got this new component that we just discussed. 
uh, yeah, fine, whatever. This is from a previous exercise we did. And okay, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to drop from the info, I'm going to drop the plugin version, okay? And you can see that if I drop here, you can see that there's no input because and, and it's kind of broken. And you can see that we get the 0.1.0. .0. So this will be very useful if, and if someone is working very extensively with our plugin, knowing if this is the version that it needs to be for compatibility issues would be very, very useful. Now, this is a really, really bad way of doing this because typically hard coding things, hard coding values, or especially having the value of your version of the plugin, which is something quite meaningful. Having it somewhere so obscure and so uh, deep in the code, like in the output of one function for one particular component, it's not good practice at all. So it's much better practice to have information that is meaningful about the overall state and the overall properties of your plugin to have it somewhere centralized. Where can we do that? Well, there's that's the second the second version that I would like to teach you today. So Grasshopper components, the template for Grasshopper plugins that uh, the McNeil staff created for us actually already has some notion of that. So you can see here, if we go all the way to the root of our project, there is this class that I forget if we have seen before or not. It's a class called the PCAMP Grasshopper Plugin Info, which is subclassing from a standard class of the Grasshopper SDK called the Assembly Info. And you can see that it already has preloaded a bunch of stuff which is the stuff that we entered manually when we first created this project. And there was a new UI with a form asking us for some information about the plugin that we were about to do. You can see that this class is very interesting because it already provides overrides for general properties, such as the name of the plugin, the icon, some description, uh, the author name, author contact, etc. So actually we could already fill in some properties here. So for example, a general uh, toolbox of uh, components to do uh, stuff, mostly for educational purposes, right? Purposes. That's one thing. The author name, I'm going to, I'm going to put it here, right? And, uh, and this is going to be at parametric camp and author contact. Uh, I think um, youtube.com slash parametric camp, right? Okay, uh, I'm not sure, yeah, yeah. So that's, so now, for example, we have added more information to our plugin. Something that we could do is we could see if there are more things that we can overwrite here. So for example, like we did in previous videos, if I write public override, you can see that there's many other properties that have not been addressed. Assembly description, blah, 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 version, whatever, the license that we want for our plugin and the version. So for example, something that we could do here is I don't care about the base. What I want is to say, this is, has to be 0.1.0, okay? So that's one thing. And this is very clean because we now have a place that is centralized where all of our, the information for our plugin is, is, um, is, um, uh, oh, where the information, all the information for our plugin is, 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 is in a, in one place, right? So what I can do now is I can say, well, instead of this, I would like to now access that value that is in the plugin info. Now, I'm not sure if I got this wrong or if I'm not getting the nice, if, I'm, if there's, there's a cleaner way of doing this, but because this class happens to be a normal class, it's not static. What that means is that in order to get access to all this information, I need to create an instance, I need to create an object that is coming from this class. So what that means is that I can say, I'm going to define a variable called info and that's going to be pcamp plugin info. It's going to be a new instance of pcamp plugin info. So that class that we have here. And now that I have that 
information, I can type info dot and access all those properties that were defined as part of that class. In this case, version, all right? If I do that, let me see if I'm going to change the number to see if something improved. So for example, number two, and I'm going to run this again. Let's see if that works. And you can see that our version component is already returning 0.2.0, which is this new value that we are taking from this centralized, re centralized repository of properties of our plugin. So this is a much better way uh, to go about outputting that version. But there is a third way that I would like to recommend as well. The idea behind this third option is that I personally find the notion of having to create an instance of this class a little weird. I don't think it's wrong. I don't think there's nothing bad with it. I just, I don't know. For some reason, that's not the way how I would have done it. Um, I just find it strange to have two instances that I would have made a static class that just contains the information there. But that's not my point. My point is that I would like to teach you a method to create a class that contains general information about your plugin, just like the one that Grasshopper provides to us from scratch. So basically doing our own version of this. And the way I'm going to do that is, first of all, I'm going to remove that version from there, all right? And I'm going to close this. And so this is probably, up. Oh, I don't know what I did here. And what I would like to do is, if you remember, we had this folder called utilities and had a and had this um, this uh, this custom class called tab properties that also inherited it from somewhere, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we, what I'm saying with this is that we do have a place where we are storing classes that somehow relate to meta properties of our plugin. So what we can do here is we can create a new item, and this is not going to be a grasshopper component. This is going to be a general class that uh, I'm going to call, for example custom plugin plugin properties all right and um, this is basically going to be a public static class that is just going to contain a bunch of information custom information for me that i want to store as part of this plugin and one that i can do is i can say i'm going to store here publicly and statically, I'm going to um, store the string version, for example. And what I would like to do is I would like to make sure that that property is something that cannot be changed by other people. So I want to turn that into a property that is only a getter property. I can do that by saying I'm going to refine that this is going to be, for example, 0 0.3.0 or I can also do the short version of this, which you're probably already familiar with from my previous videos, which is using the arrow notation to just signify the exact same thing. All right. Uh, and that I can do uh, current plugin version, something like that, right? Now, why, how would I use this now? Well, instead of instantiating a, a part of that because this class is static and if you don't remember what a static class is we have a video on what that means so the card should be popping somewhere here in the corner etc etc so the because the property is because the class is static 
I can now refer to that class by its name and access all that information without instantiating anything. So I'm going to go to, for example, Grasshopper, uh, no, what is it called? PCAMP plugin. So PCAMP plugin info. No, that's not the one. So this is in utilities and custom plugin. Oh, sorry, custom plugin properties and version. And you can see that I am now accessing that version value from my plugin, from the utilities folder, the class that is static, and this property, which is also static. And I'm going to run this. And I believe that that should work. <clears throat> All right. And as it, as it does here now, it's 0 0.3.0. All right. Basically, what we've done is the exact same thing that we had with the standard tools, with the standard um, class the, that Grasshopper gives us, but our way. Which one is better? Which one is worse? Well, honestly, I'm not in favor of reinventing the wheel. So if we do have some place where we already have information about our plugin, it's probably good to reuse this and to extend this. So perhaps this is not a clean way because it's not consistent and now I have data in two different places that I need to manage. That could also be argued. But um, this was basically an excuse for me to teach you how this could have been done if we didn't have this kind of class and how you could do this, for example, from for a DLL or a custom library that you're writing from absolute scratch. That could be another way uh, to do this, right? And um, perhaps also something that would have been quite clean and better to do is to, if we're really being serious about semantic versioning, something that we could do is we could store these properties, each one of the levels as different numbers. So I could say, for example, public static string uh, major version, and sorry, this is going to be an integer and that becomes zero. And then I can do minor here and I can do patch, right? And then I get the three and then this becomes, instead of that becomes major and then a, I can do a dot here and then minor and then I can do a dot here and then I can do patch version, etc. right? Arguably, this could also be um, good, all right? Maybe a little cleaner. I don't know if you really need to keep track of the individual numbers one by one, up to you, all right? There's actually many different ways this can be approached. Uh, it pretty much depends on your taste, okay? Beautiful. With this, I think I'm gonna wrap it up this video. Thank you very much. Um, I will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. All right. So <laughs> I, it looks like we're in sync, uh, Victor. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, the, the problem is, the problem is that with your approach, Victor, you're always relying on the version of the assembly and the version of the plugin being the same, which you may not want to, uh, sometimes, you know, um, but entirely up to you. I need to record the introduction. Okay. So. Let me pause. Let me uh, let me pause this. Okay. 
And do I need to compile again? I probably need to compile again, right? Yes. Fine. I'll recompile. Private static read only. I'm so annoyed. How can I make, how can I change? Does anyone know how to change the default size of the Rhino that you load? I don't know how to do that. I know, Victor, but my point is, from an educational standpoint, like teaching people how to do that by themselves. I think I would rather do that than show like other workarounds. Okay. Hello, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp, and welcome to another video in the series Advanced Development in Grasshopper, where I would like to teach you a little bit of version management, because when you're developing a plugin, knowing which version you're working with is actually very important, because as you start developing and adding more things and more things, things change, things break. So having a sense of which version of the plugin you're using and being consistent with that is very helpful. So something that I would like to teach you today is something as easy as given our plugin, I would like to teach you how to create a simple component that just displays the version of the plugin that we're working with. So for example, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and something that you can update in the code of your component um, using semantic versioning. And something that will be interesting to learn about this idea of uh, displaying custom properties of your plugin is also how to handle those kind of custom properties in your plugin, either doing it manually or using it the way with the classes that the Grasshopper template for plugins provide to us. So this will be a good exercise on storing and handling metadata or general properties of your Grasshopper plugin. Let's take a look at the how to make a simple component that spits out the version of your plugin. Beautiful. So I was going to do two videos, but I'm just going to do one. Yeah. And I was going to plug in version, uh, version management deprecation. That's a whole other topic. And, uh, are we going to do that today? I don't know if we're going to do that today. Custom plugin. Um, so ooh, what is next? Deprecating components, making it invisible, keep it in the plugin. All right. So let me Google something real quick. Grasshopper, C sharp, show deprecation tag, draw a text tag. No. Show old component tag. How to make a customized component old. Name the class with obsolete, so nothing, nothing like. It, that will make it have the old tag. Class component construct.
All right, so Michael Pryor is here to the rescue, as usual. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So let's see if that works, actually. So I've never done this, I believe. So let's call this obsolete obsolete and i'm going to run this it does work Woohoo! very nice <laughs> okay beautiful thank you michael <laughs> All right, so then we're going to undo that. And I guess we can probably make a video about that real quick. So what is this video going to be? I want to teach you, I want to teach folks how to, I want to teach folks how to, uh, I want to teach folks how to uh, take a, how to take, I want to teach folks how to take a component, let's say extend its functionality, right? And how to handle deprecating the component so that it's not useful anymore. And the way to do that would be so let's say I'm going to make this let's say that I do so for example if I do info where is info I think I want to show an example where I get an error. So p manage so p manager dot add at integer oh, okay. uh, mayor and then Let's say major minor and then patch. Patch and then here I'm going to say VA set data. I'm going to try Basically, what I'm trying to do is trying to find an example of how to show what would happen if we didn't manage this correctly and then show how to manage the, the situation. So what I would like to do is I would like to now run this and hope that I get some kind of uh, error. Yes. Our child archive is corrupt, etc. etc. Yes, and I do get it, but it's not okay. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to copy and paste this here on the side, and I'm going to undo everything. And I'm going to run the plugin again. Okay. Mm hmm. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. 
Info plugin version. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So how are we going to do this video? I'm going to do the intro. I'm going to explain. This video is about how to handle updates that change the structure of Mm hmm. So we, because we have that, and let let me see what are the properties. Window, view, solution explorer. So for example, and this is the update one. Simulation elastic chain. Mm hmm. Why am I getting, I, I never removed this? Vector preview components. Yeah, I need to remember. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Which is going to give me an error. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's, let's get started then. No, actually, perhaps I do want to, I do want to, uh, I will want to report an introduction for this one so that I can show the old component here. Do I have some very old grasshopper definition where I can show all those old, does anyone have a very old, well, I can probably find that online quite easily, honestly. Mm, I don't know, for example, um, uh, grasshopper forum. And uh, yeah, I can probably just from I don't know. Something crazy like 2000 or Distance logic, for example. Distance logic. Whoa, this is very old school. I don't even know if this is going to work. Distance logic. Mm -hmm. Okay, it does work. All right, so maybe I can start with this. Mm -hmm. And am I going to do the introduction, actually? Am I going to do the introduction right now? Let me think about that. Are we doing the introduction? Or do I want to show the introduction with the... I will want to do the introduction with the... I will want to do the introduction... with. I will want to do the introduction with the examples that we're working on. So I'm going to do that by the end. Okay, so I'm going to start explaining the topic right away. So first of all, why are we doing this? So you may have downloaded Grasshopper definitions from the internet, from uh, old forums, or maybe you are, have opened old grasshopper definitions of your past previous lives. And uh, you have noticed that when you opened old code, very often you get components that have this kind of old tag on top of them. And actually, for example, this component, grid rectangular, uh, if I try to find it in my, in my component box, doesn't exist anymore. 
So the idea is that when you develop code that, and when you look at the future of that code, some good practices about code being good and working across time is that when you make changes in a particular code base, you want to make sure that those changes are going to be changes that do not break previous code. So imagine if I were to uh, open an old definition and it turns out that the code that was inside of these components had changed over the course of, the, of time and development, then maybe the behavior of this definition would actually change and it would not work as it used to work five years ago, 10 years ago. So it's good practice that when you make such changes, you do it in a way that you don't break code that already exists and that people are out there, are, that the people out there are using. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that you also want to make sure that if you make changes, you still provide access to old versions of the code in the previous state that it was. Again, because you don't want people who had those older versions to just not have that code. If the developers had removed this component that is not available anymore, I can use it, I cannot click it, but if they had totally removed it from the Grasshopper code base, if I were to open this old definition with a modern Grasshopper, this component would not be available, it wouldn't show and the whole thing would break and my old definition would not be usable. So providing ways to access old code in the way it was written back then, even if that code is not available anymore or if it has been updated, it's actually a very, very good practice. So what I'd like to teach you in this video is how to make those two things. First of all, how to create, um, how to create, how to make changes on code that already exists and make sure that those changes are not go are going to be backwards compatible. So the people who have old versions of the code still have access to those versions. And I would also like to teach you how to prevent people from using old versions that exist and that are hidden somewhere in, in your code base, but prevent them from using the old versions and make sure that moving on after you make changes, they only have access to the newer versions. So let's take a look then at how can we make this happen uh, when we write our Grasshopper plugin. Well, you can. You mean, Victor, you mean like this? Grid rectangular? Oh, I had no idea about that. Victor, you're really, really saving my back today, huh? <laughs> that is quite awesome. How did you find this out? Have you done this in the past, Victor? Did you find it on, on the Google forums, etc., on some forum? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so... Custom plugin properties. As an example, we're going to start with our almighty component that we did in the previous video in this series, the one that gives us the semantic version of the current plugin that we're working with. And the way we implemented it in the past was by just outputting a string with the three values of the major, the minor, and the patch versions. But it could arguably be interesting. I mean, this is very easy to split and to parse into integers, whatever, but it takes a little bit of time and, and work. So 
I guess it would be interesting to have the component directly output as numbers also the major, the minor, and the patch version, right? So that could be something, for example, I'm going to close this, and that could be something here is where we had the information in this public static class that we made. And this is the component that spits out just the text version of all of that together. And that is drawn from the static class. So if I were to overwrite this with a version that had an output for the major, the minor, the patch, and then it outputs those three values as integers, this would be a very nice improvement to that component. However, if we just do this, if we just basically change the code right away, and especially, this is also a big one in Grasshopper, if we change the component structurally, so if we add or remove more inputs, if we add or remove outputs, then something not good stuff is going to happen. So let me show you. If I now open the same file, the file that had a version component but expected the output to be just one thing, look at what's going to happen. I am getting already IO generated these five messages that are errors, and this is it's telling me that the art that the archive is corrupt. This is because the file that it read expected one output, and now it's finding that the component actually yields four outputs. I can still execute the file, so you see it still works, and it gives me the major, minor, and the patch, so it kind of works, but I get errors, it's just not clean. So what we're going to do is we're going to scratch that, and what we're going to do is we're going to create a new version of the version component. <laughs> and then we're going to follow the right paths to, to manage that. So what is that going to look like? Well, first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to bring everything to the original state. So I'm going to keep the original version of this component. And remember, something that is very important is that Grasshopper knows which component is which, if you remember, because of the global unique identifier, right? This is basically the ID or like the signature or the DNA of the component, if you will. And whenever a grasshopper sees a component with this name, it expects the exact same behavior. So what we will need to do is basically make a new version of this component that uh, has the extended functionality by maintaining this current version. So what is that going to look like? First of all, where is this plugin version component? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and I'm going to paste this component. So now I have two versions. And the copy version, I'm going to call it plugin version two. All right, for example. So this is going to be the new version. It has a different class name. So now they both can live on the same, um, on the same project. And I'm going to rename the, the file as well. So to make sure that we now know. <clears throat> and I'm going to call this, I'm going to change the description also here. But just for, just for reasons that you will see here, I would, I would not do this otherwise. Okay. Now, the last thing that I want to do is this, if I run this code, this is not going to work, um, I think. It doesn't work. It's not going to work because I, since I copy pasted, I do now have two components, two possible components that have the exact same global unique identifier. You see component ID conflict. And this is a terrible thing. No two components in your plugin can have the same, uh, the same ID. So we need to change that. And, uh, for example, one thing that I typically use is that, um, I have these. I think there's a way to do that in C sharp inside, but I think I have here online UI. Yes. Yeah, so here I have this website that I typically use to generate random um, GUIDs. So I'm going to copy this one. I'm going to replace the one that we got from the, from the copy pasting. And now you can see that, well, sorry, uh, let me close this. Let me close this again. So I'm going to stop all of this. And now the version, the extended version, the one that is newer, 
I would like to add all this code. So the version, the major, minor, etc., etc. All right. And then, so now what I can do is I can say, oops, something went wrong. What is wrong here? Version two component, then implement register inputs. Oh, sorry. I think I copy pasted where I shouldn't. So I'm going to yeah, register inputs. Sorry, I copy pasted where I shouldn't. So now, all right. So now I have, I have the two versions of my, of my component. I have the old one, which still works because I haven't changed it. I only added a new one. And then if I go to info, you can see that I have two ones that are the exact, that have the exact same name. So I have the old one here, but I have, can you see the improved in the description? I have the improved one, which gives me the four outputs. And you can see that nothing broke, everything is working well, etc., etc. So this is the way to go when you make changes or improvements. What you should actually do, and I know it takes a lot of work, what you should actually do is you should actually copy and paste your component, give it a new name, and then make all the changes that you want, keeping the old one in the code base. All right. So, but now I have two problems here. First, we want this deprecation. We want that sticker, the old sticker to show up here. That's one thing that we want. And another thing that we want is I probably don't want to give people the option of going for the old version or the new version. I want to get rid of the old one as well, right? So I'm going to keep this here. Uh, so now you can see that in my grasshopper definition, I have both. I have the old and I have the new. So I'm going to save this file as it is, all right? And then I'm going to do a couple of things. First, I want the tag, I want the sticker to show up for the component that is not, that I don't, that I don't want anymore. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the older one and here in the name, I'm going to right click. I'm going to go to rename. All right. And then I'm going to add to the name of the class. And this is a very grasshopper thing. This is not a C sharp thing. I'm going to add here an underscore and I'm going to write the world obsolete, obsolete in uppercase. All right, and I'm going to change that. You see that the file name changes, the class name changes, the constructor name changes. And just by doing that, Grasshopper is actually able to recognize this tag from the class name. And it's going to be able to assign this old obsolete tag to basically any component, any component that has that name. So you can see that I opened my same file and I already get this tag here. And so that's great, but you can see that I also get it here on the icons and that I still have the two versions. I still have the two versions available to drag. So I can still drag the old one. I can still create the old one, which is probably something that we don't want to give as a possibility. So how do we do that? Well, if you remember from previous videos, there was this property that we could override in Grasshopper components, which was the exposure. So if I go all the way down here, you can say public override, and you can see that I should have exposure somewhere. Exposure, yes. So exposure is basically a way to say where the component is going to show up in the order of the components of the, um, in, in the category. So, and actually, uh, the way to control this is you have primary, secondary, ternary, et cetera, et cetera, correct? And uh, what that means is that the, there's this nice division um, by the, that you can see in the category. I'm, I'm going to show that, all right? But what you want to do, instead of having primary, secondary, or whatever, I think primary is the default for all of them. What you want to do is you want to make this component hidden by making the exposure hidden, what you're basically saying is that it's not going to show up on the drop down in the categories. And therefore, it's going to basically disappear from a click and drag kind of option. So if I now run this code,
you can see that you can see two things. First, I still do have the component with my old tag here, but if I go to my breakdown, you can see that it's not available anymore. The only one that shows up available is the plugin version that is improved, and you can see that in the description. The only one that I have the option to drag and drop is the new version. People, if they have all definitions, they will still have access to the old one, and it will work correctly because it's drawing the information from the static class, etc., etc. But they won't have the option to um, to use the old one ever again. They just cannot drop it into the a definition ever again. Actually, that is not entirely true because thanks to Victor, a parametric camper, uh, he was pointing out while we were recording this video that there's actually this trick where you can actually access all deprecated hidden components. If you double click on the canvas and you start with a pound sign, this will give you access to components that have been deprecated or that do not exist anymore. So for example, um, plugin version, where, did, where do I have that plug? You see, here I can use plugin version or I can choose the old one. <laughs> you know, this is very nerdy and hacky, but I don't think this is very useful because in general, I really think you should always stick to the most modern and the most debugged um, functional version of any component. Okay, just a hacky thing. So that's it. Uh, these are the two things that you need to make sure to remember every time you want to extend, improve, or work on a new version of a component that already exists. Make sure to, first of all, not change the existing code, but create a new component with the same name and most of the things the same. Change the ID so that there are no conflicts and then work your changes into the new component that you have created. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that for the old component, you want to make sure that you, you want to make sure that you, first of all, that you rename the class to add the obsolete suffix so that you get the tag. And you also want to make sure that you change the exposure to hidden so that it doesn't show up on the dropdown and people cannot add it anymore. Those are just the simple, the simple things to do here. And um, another thing that some people do, I've seen that, well, I'm seeing it. I actually do it to myself. I, because this can get complicated over time when you start deprecating and making a lot of things obsolete. Something that I have done in the past and I've seen other people do is sometimes what you just want to do is you want to take all the components that you don't use anymore and put them somewhere. So for example, I'm going to create a folder that is called obsolete and I'm just going to move this one, the one that, that, that doesn't exist. I'm just going to move it into obsolete. And the way Grasshopper projects work actually will um, because all the components are generated and created, they don't, it doesn't matter where they are in their folders, everything will still work uh, the same. So it's a nice way to basically keep the structure of your Grasshopper plugin project clean in, in a way, if you will. It's like having a folder that is kind of the obsolete folder or the cemetery or the graveyard or however you want to call it. Components that are not in use anymore but they should be available and the, co the code should be accessible for backwards compatibility, okay? Unless you release a major version uh, where you make breaking changes and anything that was obsolete and old, you get rid of it, okay? That's also an approach. That's why we have major versions. Beautiful. With that, I think that's all I wanted to cover about deprecation and um, obsolete components and during development. If you thought any of this was useful or you liked it or you learned anything, maybe consider liking this video, subscribing to the channel, etc, etc. Otherwise, I will see you on the next video, which I'm not sure what it's going to be, but I'm sure it's going to be something fun and exciting and nerdy. <laughs> Thank you very much and see you in the next one. Bye! Oh my God, what happened there? Victor, thanks a lot for that.
Yeah. Ugh. Can we ban this user? Oh, that was a yeah, that was a lot. What the hell? Well, thanks for taking care of the <laughs> thanks for taking care of the nasty robots, Victor. <laughs> All right. How was this? Uh, did you like it? No. Did you learn anything? Good practices? Anything you didn't know? I don't think. Victor, I think at some point you should take over and start recording these tutorials, no? Because like, I'm actually learning a lot from you. <laughs> All right, beautiful. Okay, so it's my lunch time. Um, I'm actually quite hungry. I don't think I don't did I? I did have breakfast, but I'm still very hungry anyway. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here as usual. Remember, there will be no live stream next week. I am traveling and visiting family, so I won't be available. And I will see you on the next one, which I believe will be. No, it will not be the week after because I'm also traveling. Yeah, because we're traveling again, remember? Um, I'm not sure if COVID is over or not, but I think traveling is back <laughs> for the good or the bad. Anyway, thank you very much, everyone. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot, Victor, for the recommendations and for taking care of the robots. <laughs> and I will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you.